Hello and welcome to The Aid Station. I'm Chris Robb and today, absolutely, certainly, we're going to have an inspiring conversation. We're heading off to Dallas in America to meet Tony Reid. Tony is the CEO of the Caribbean Endurance Sports Corporation and he's also the Executive Director of the National Black Marathoners Association. A great story to tell. Really excited to talk to you, Tony. Great to meet you. Thanks for making the time. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, and it's just, you know, it's so wonderful how this kind of story of the aid station meanders and how we get to meet people. I did an amazing interview a couple of weeks ago with Diane Ellis from the Reggae Marathon. She suggested that I should have a chat with you and, and here we are. And, you know, she's she's told me some of your story. We've got some of your background, which is amazing, but nobody tells it better than the person themselves. So why don't we start with a little bit of your background, please, Tony? Okay. Well, I... Um, uh was involved in sports in high school, uh, ran uh, cross country track, and also played soccer. I uh, got out of high school and uh, went to college. I wasn't very good, by the way, in track. I was what I would call the fifth man on a four-man relay team. <laughs> that, so that kind of meant I was faster than the average person, but no college was going to offer me a scholarship for anything. And uh, it was while I was in graduate school that I really got interested in distance running. Uh, unfortunately, I have the body of a sprinter and the mentality of a distance runner, which means I'm somewhat endurance challenged, but I just really enjoy getting outdoors and enjoying the, the beautiful scenery and enjoy meeting people. So I ran my first marathon, the Cowtown Marathon in 1982, and I set a lifetime goal of uh, trying to do at least two marathons a year, which was either the Dallas Marathon or the Cowtown Marathon. And so for about 10 or 15 years. Uh, all the marathons I ran were in the state of Texas. Uh -huh. And it wasn't until I ran my 47th marathon that I finally went outside of the state of Texas. Uh, in uh, 2003, I ran my 50th marathon. In 2007, I became the first Black in the world to run marathons on all seven continents. And in 2009, I ran my 100th marathon. And in 2013, I finally finished running a marathon in each of the 50 states. Wow. So I'm what still good. running a little bit. Still running. And yeah, I, th I think I'm right in saying your tally is 131 now. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Wow. Yes. What, a, what a wonderful achievement. And and then I, th I think you, you also set a target to run on average at least three miles a day for the rest of your life when you set that as well. Is that correct? Yes, when I was about eight years old, I was diagnosed with a pre-diabetic condition and the doctor said I'll go on insulin by the time I was a teenager. However, at my high school, you had to participate in sports. I ended up losing weight and I didn't have to go on insulin. Uh, then while I was a sophomore, junior in college, I read a book by Dr. Kenneth Cooper. And there was one paragraph in the book that said diabetics who are dependent on insulin could either decrease their insulin intake or go completely off of it if they maintain a healthy lifestyle. So I set a lifetime goal of averaging three miles a day. I've kept my running journal now since 1979. Uh, middle of next month, I would have logged 47,000 miles of running. Wow. And uh, I'll be 66 in July, and I'm still not on insulin. Wow, what a great story and great inspiration. And, you know, another example of the incredible power of this mass participation industry that's been stopped in its tracks right now, sadly, all around the world. And I guess that brings us to, you know, what, what's your current situation? What's life like in Dallas? And, and obviously, you know, one of the things that you do and one of the reasons that Diane introduced us is you take people from America to, to run in the Caribbean. And obviously, that's been stopped to a degree as well. What, tell us a little bit about, the, you know, your current situation and, and life for you at the moment. Well, I live near uh, White Rock Lake here in Dallas, which is a nine mile loop that is uh, kind of the, the hotbed places for the runners to come uh, when they're training. And during the pandemic, there were so many people out there walking and trying to ride bikes there at the lake that I actually had to change my route and start running through, through the different neighborhoods. Wow. Uh, so, you know, I, I really was hoping that I would get in more miles there, but I really wasn't able to get back there to run consistently until last month. 
So that's, uh, I had gotten all my vaccinations and everything and things are kind of quieted down, I guess you might say there at the lake. Uh, but, you know, I have my lifetime objective of averaging three miles a day. So uh, I was, was still able to do that throughout the pandemic. Uh, for me, the, the one thing I ended up giving up was swimming. I had set a goal of swimming 1500 meters two to three times a week. And unfortunately with the pandemic, it shut the pools down. So I'm just now getting back into that. Wow, that's that's great. That that balance in terms of you know the, the swimming obviously taking some of the impact off off the body as well. I'm I'm uh, I'm one of those. I s cycling for me to to give the dodgy knees a break, uh, but but anything to get out there and uh, and exercise. And then you yeah, tell us a little bit about you know obviously it's been challenging times for many. What have been apart from you know not being able to train in your normal place you've obviously overcome significant challenges in your life already but what have been some of the biggest challenges and how's that kind of tied in to the work that you do with the caribbean endurance sports corporation and and the national black marathoners association okay uh when i was running running marathons on the different continents uh, I was with a, with a group from Marathon Tours and Travel, and we were getting ready to run the Great Wall of the Great Wall Marathon. And even though we hadn't finished seven continents, uh, the people in the tour group, we, are, we were already talking about, well, what are we going to do next? And I couldn't help but notice in working with and being around a lot of high achieving people, they're always looking ahead. You know, well, what are we going to do with, when this particular event is over? And I remember we were saying this as well, why don't we try doing marathons on all seven continents, but let's do them in the islands. Because all of us love going to the, you know, going to the beach, we love the sea. And at that time, uh, the only international marathon challenge, so to speak, was the seven continents. Then several years later, they started the Abbott World Majors. Uh, however, personally, I like the small races. I'm, I'm happy to say that I have had six top 50 finishes in marathons and I have run six marathons with 50 or fewer people, wow. but I still count all of them as top 50 finishes. And those are some so, of those medals you were telling me before we came on air. Those are the ones that are over your right shoulder. Those are the real special ones. Those are the achievements. And then all the other ones yeah. uh, on, on, the, on the wall, just making up that color of the, of your, the amazing tapestry of your running life. Yes. So um, I realized that I, I enjoy small marathons and that there are a lot of other people that probably do also. And so I like to think of the Five Island Challenge as the, uh, the opposite almost of the Marathon World Majors in that you get to run on islands, uh, the Barbados, Bahamas, Bermuda, Jamaica, and Cayman Islands. Uh, in Jamaica, of course, you run the Reggae Marathon. Mm -hmm. Uh, unlike the world majors, there's also a half marathon option. And um, just in case some people kind of party too much the night before the, you know, uh, <laughs> be, before the marathon, you know, they may party too much and decide, you know what, I just don't feel like doing a marathon today, I'll do a half marathon. Well, we also have what we call our combo thon option. So this is for people who, you know, they could do four marathons and a half marathon or any combination of marathons and half marathons at those five different locations, and they could get the combo thon medal. So we wanted to make it so, something that was easy for everyone. The events are a lot more laid back, they're a lot more fun, you get to party a little bit more. And you know, it's not as kind of stuffed shirt, I guess you might say, as, as the world majors. Wow. So, so, sounds like a fun group of people that you take all over the world and, and what incredible camaraderie you've built up. And, and I guess that, you know, lead, lead that into, into leadership. I mean, you've taken a leadership role in terms of creating that, uh, you know, your, your work with the National Black Marathoners Association. Love to learn a little bit about that. And also, you know, any leadership principles. So, you know, we have as an audience, we have people from, you know, leaders of our industry across all the different verticals down to, you know, small businesses in places like Mexico and South America and, Ac and Africa, uh, you know, in the early stages, young entrepreneurs. I mean, have you have you got any guiding principles and, and anything that's helped chart your journey from a leadership perspective that you'd like to share? Oh, uh, yes. In fact, I wrote a book called Running to Leadership, 
with finishing 100 plus marathons on all seven continents teaches us about success. Uh, I had taken the same principles that I had used for running marathons and applied those principles to managing my, my staffs when I worked in corporate America. So I was a 25 year corporate executive working in information technology. And just to give you an example, in one particular case, uh, we were given a $10 million project uh, that was to last about 18 months. Uh, we did it for $2.6 million in nine months. Wow. Another project that was supposed to be uh, 18 to 24 months, we managed to do that one also in about eight to nine months. Uh, what I discovered was that there's more to motivation than just having a highly motivated employee. Uh, it takes uh, having an individual who can set smart goals, who's highly self-motivated. They have to be able to know how to plan. And last but not least, they have to know how to execute that plan and overcome obstacles associated with it. So I worked with my staff members, not on setting goals that were corporate related, but on goals that were personally related. Uh, so for example, uh, I had members who ended up being amateur race car drivers, they enjoy flying kites, big, you know, kind of two-handed kites. Mm -hmm. uh, because I realized that individuals who came into work and who didn't have a life outside of work would spend all their time there at work and would take a 10 hour task and stretch it out to 12 or 15 hours. Mm. But people who had a life outside of work, like, like me, my objective every day I walked into work was to leave as quickly as possible because mm -hmm. I had more fun and exciting things that I wanted to do. So uh, therefore I would get to work, I would be very effective, very efficient, get the job done so I could go home and play. So I instilled that same mentality in my staff members by finding out things that were on their bucket list. And I encouraged them to pursue those items on their bucket list. And for about $25 an employee, I would get a magazine subscription to, um, for them that uh, was associated with pursuing their particular goal. So if a person said, for example, that they wanted to write a book, I would have a magazine sent to the office once a month talking about being a good writer. If they want to be a rock climber, I would get, uh, was it Rock and Ice magazine and have that sent to them. But uh, the only thing I wouldn't support was if someone said that they enjoy shooting guns. <laughs> <laughs> I did not have guns and ammo sent to the office. Yeah. Uh, so we, we ended up having a lot of fun and, uh, you know, my staff, you know, they were really excited about the, about the projects at work and they were excited about pursuing their personal goals and objectives. Well, what a, what a great strategy and, and, and so relevant right now. I was literally just reading an article this morning. Uh, there's a survey being done in, in terms of, uh, you know, how more productive people are at home or less productive. And, and you know, the, the overwhelming evidence seems to be that we're far less productive, people being inter interrupted, not, you know, particularly the ones that aren't making time for their passions and the things that they love. So a really, really relevant tip for, you know, for managers and individuals that are, that are stuck at home to find something as best you can in these times that, that, that drives your passion and fuels your desire to do, to do the things outside of work. So as you say, get in, get it done as quickly as possible, whether that's in your home office or your corporate office and get out and do the fun things that you like in life. That's a wonderful tip. And, and, and as always, thank you for sharing that. As always, you know, time flies by and we get to the stage where I'm going to ask you for an, an inspiring story and you're an inspiring person yourself. Wow, what you've done is incredibly inspirational. Is there anything that you could share to, to, to leave us with an inspirational note, please, Tony? Uh, I would say, uh, yes, uh, try to surround yourself with like-minded individuals. Uh, for about, I guess, six or seven years, I always have uh, dinner with a couple of my friends on the East Coast, uh, that's Lisa Davis and Sika Henry. And when the three of us get together for our, for our kind of annual dinner, uh, we talk about our goals and objectives and the things that we hope to pursue. And over this four or five year period, uh, Lisa Davis went on to set the Guinness Book of World Records for running marathons on all seven continents. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just found out last week that uh, Sika Henry became the first African-American female triathlete to win her professional card. Wow. So between the three of us, we've all been kind of motivating and encouraging and inspiring each other to just kind of keep pushing ahead. 
So I tell people, surround yourself with like-minded people who are very goal-oriented and who actually pursue the goals. What, what, a, what a great tip, not only an inspirational tip, but another leadership tip. Uh, Tony, it's so wonderful to speak to you. Thank you for sharing uh, your great story and uh, and hope there's an opportunity to catch up somewhere. Uh, there's certainly plenty of small little marathons in, in, in my part of the world. I live in Bali. There's a wonderful little marathon here as well. So hopefully okay. we'll cross paths at some stage uh, on, 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 a, on a start line or a finish line somewhere and, 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 and have a few drinks to party afterwards. But really wish you all the very best and thank you so much for, for taking the time to chat. Okay, well, thank you very much. You can always come over to the islands and join us for.